Do you work in sort of sticks that uh, I pick up underneath these gum trees that, that directly come from here? Like people often say, where do I find the sticks? And it's, the answer is invariably out the front or out the back. It just so happens that his studio in Clifton, in the old School of Arts building, pre any renovations, was right next door to my high school best friend. So I went over there one day, knocked on the door, came in, and Ian was living downstairs, but we walked upstairs, and it was upstairs where Ian had his studio. And that studio was where he made his sculptures. So there were a few of those sitting around. But my, the, the memory I have is of Ian sitting in a chair with this wall of sticks behind him and just him talking to me about what he did and me just getting a sense of, wow, this, this art thing is pretty fascinating. You can make a life out of this. I was only 16, yeah. When I met Ian, I'd never been to a gallery and most people in Wollongong hadn't and most of the students hadn't. I'll go up there and there's just like stuff from the ceiling to the floor. There were sticks just hanging from the rafters. It was like the most magical place. There were piles of sticks, there were half-formed sculptures, there were fully formed sculptures. I remember kind of looking up and it was like things were inhabiting the space. I think the sense of um, a kind of chaos and what other people saw as messiness, even in the mess there was a kind of order of like how things were grouped, how he bundled things or how he stacked his work. And then there was this like elegance that came through in a lot of the work in terms of the way that he, he really brought things down to the essence. He'd spoken about this studio and said, come on down and um, he said, you can sleep over. You know, there's a pub nearby to eat and have a drink. You know, I always thought of Kurt Schwitters, who built Mersbau, the house that um, he lived in his collage, and Ian kind of lived in his environment too, with uh, at, uh, a kind of orderly chaos that uh, he could uh, sweep a section aside for to put a mattress down for my wife and I to spend the night on, you know, underneath the beautiful window overlooking the ocean. And that was all um, very well organised. Stacks of sticks and works on the go. And uh, yeah, it was a, a wonderful place to visit. Ian was a maker. There was no intellectual baloney about Ian. He put things together because he wanted to put them together to see what they would look like. And that's what artists do. It's about curiosity. So we'd go out on a, what we would call a field trip. I just think he enjoyed getting out of getting out of the school and just getting out there into, the, into nature that he loves so much. It was methodical. You had straightish ones, bendy ones and wriggly ones. So, so they weren't just collected willy-nilly.
Ian didn't seem like an academic in any sense of the word. He was um, connected to materials and processes and asked questions of what people were doing but never held force about the theory behind it. He just, uh, there, was, there was a theory, a very strong theory embedded in all of his work but it spoke through the work, not through the lecturing. As far as Ian getting a job in universities these days, not a snowflake's chance in hell. It, it, it's a, a sad statement, but that's to the great detriment of universities. I don't think he would, he would have thought of himself in that formal way of teacher. He would just see everything he did as an extension of his artistic practice or his life or the ecology that he built around himself or that was naturally attracted to him. There wasn't really any hierarchy in Ian's world. And when he came up against hierarchy or institutional hierarchy, it didn't quite work. he would just ignore it <laughs> and carry on. And um, he just applied that to every component of his life, which was both beautiful and difficult for him as well. Ian was a typical youngest child of six. All the older siblings had an important role in his life because Dad was away at war. There was a perfectionist side to Ian. It was important that he knew how to do things properly. So just pushing a wheelbarrow, he needed to get that right. Put your head on my they moved out to Hillsville when Ian was a teenager, so his high school education was at Lilydale and Hillsville high schools. He did have a fascination with Eastern art and when he discovered Japanese landscapes he couldn't get enough of them. So much so that he kept a book from Lilydale High School all his life. Picasso once said that it wasn't until he, Picasso, was 40 that he learned how to paint like a child. Ian intuitively had that innocent playfulness and I think that was the joy of Ian's work. It was dead serious and it was fun. Ian's um, understanding of drawing and his use of his sticks as drawn lines is absolutely what I've spent most of my teaching years telling students about. understanding how gesture informs a structure. Being able to read the inner dynamic of the figure that's not actually a visible contour. That's where Ian's eye for what a stick could say is absolutely one and the same thing. It really is just looking and finding the inner gesture. What does it say? And it's not about superficial exterior appearances, it's, it's within. One of my absolute favourite works is Whispering Ant because it's such a, an extraordinary conception. The construction is quite large, so it was a really complex work to bring together. It's about sort of this frenetic activity. So imagine just thinking about, you know, that ants would come and they like butt up against each other, that clear observation, and then they separate. And in that separation, it's like in his mind, this idea of a whisper. He was an influencer. If he was around now, he, he would be labelled an in influencer. Um, all he'd need was a um, social media organiser and he, he'd be, he would be viral, I'm sure. There was nothing um, positional or al alpha about him. It was more uh, an openness to him that was so compelling. 
He recognised that I was a single mum. I hadn't had access to galleries or the world of art or seen art books at all. And he just said, everything you need is at your feet. I didn't need to feel bad about what I didn't have. I don't need to go and buy anything. Whatever you want, whatever you need is at your feet. I love the place with the escarpment and the sea. I've seen practically every bit of coast in Australia and uh, this is it for me, you know. Can you think of any other thing? Well, I'm not moving till, till I die or they kick me out, whatever comes first. You know, it's people try to turn it into restaurants and things. I hope it just remains as it is. And uh, I hope it still belongs to the people of Clifton there and not in private ownership. Hopefully I'll still be alive in 2000, still be living here, but I, who knows, okay? <laughs>